Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, a constructed response set on the topic of portfolio construction and the learning module on fixed income portfolio management. We'll cover parts of three LOSs. Uh, let's go back to level one. We had great conversations about how to measure portfolio return. Remember, we started with yield to maturity, then we threw in spot rates, and then we threw in forward rates and current yields and probably a bunch of other things in there. Measures of risk, you remember default risk and interest rate risk, although there are other kinds of risk out there, but those are the two main ones. That second LOS, a model for fixed income returns. When we become a bondholder, what do we hope to get out of it? We hope to get out some coupon payments, right? And a capital gain. I mean, that's true for any kind of an investment. And that capital gain, for example, if we buy a bond that trades at a discount, we hold it to maturity, that's kind of a built-in capital gain there. But what we can do is buy a bond today and then sell it before it matures and replace that bond with a longer term bond. Uh, we can either uh, try to roll down the yield curve or roll over, or is there a roll up the yield curve? I'm not sure that's a, not sure that's a model. And then we'll talk about leverage in, in that last question. So let's look at some of the case details. We've got Lena, a junior analyst and her manager, Kai, tasked with evaluating three fixed income funds, sorry, potential addition to their fixed income offerings. There are the names, Blue Water, Crimson, and Crayford. That'll be in exhibit one here on the next slide. But these last two, this last sentence here is relatively uh, important. So no reinvestment income. What that will do is that'll just simplify the math in one of our, one of our answers. But this uh, yield curve remains unchanged. You might be tempted to think, okay, the yield curve is flat and it's going to stay flat. It's going to be flat forever and ever. But that's probably not a good assumption. Uh, the yield curve could be whatever shape. It could be upward sloping, could be downward sloping. Now, remember that upward sloping and downward sloping yield curves, they have lots and lots of meanings in there. And there are several theories uh, that have been advanced to kind of explain the shape of the yield curve. But remember, essentially, an upward sloping yield curve means that investors expect interest rates to rise and just the opposite for a downward sloping yield curve. Now, we're not going to, in this case, we're not going to test that explicitly, but having that base knowledge is going to help us understand some of these slides here, in particular, this, uh, this exhibit one. All right, so there's uh, the three funds across the top and then some characteristic data down the left-hand column. Let's look at today's price and then the expected price a year from now. So think about, there's blue water, 108. And what did we say back here? Okay, yield curve remains unchanged. So uh, if it's upward sloping, boy, what the mean? If interest rates rise, then blue water is gonna lose, well, what is that? $2.50 per bond. But notice Crimson and Crayford over there, they have 95 to 98, 92 to 94. So perhaps these funds are pursuing some other kind of a strategy that benefits them when, uh, when interest rates rise. Look at the three modified durations. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say those are probably uh, statistically equal. Although, of course, we need standard deviation and maybe some other things to see if they're uh, different, but those three are ne nearly the same. Coupon payment, notice Blue Water relatively low, then Crimson and Crayford are much higher. And then the present value, the, uh, the portfolio value, 152, 78, and 86. And then I like the second part of this exhibit one. This is going to help us with one of our questions. So Blue Water has an overwhelming majority of fixed income, uh, fixed coupon paying bonds. Crimson and Crayford way less, but notice that Crimson and Crayford, they've got a bunch of floating rate bonds and a bunch of inflation linked bonds. So that difference there between the two on the right and then Blue Water, that's probably going to be a question somewhere in there. All right, so we just did uh, you know, a little bit of interest rate risk conversation. So let's have a brief default risk conversation here. Notice Blue Water has nothing but investment grade bonds. Crimson and Crayford, they have 20 and 15% of less than investment grade bonds. And then they don't have anything that's less than C or any unrated bonds. Now notice there are dashes down on the bottom right of this table, which tells us there's nothing in terms of 
equity for Crimson and Cravered. There's no borrowed funds, so therefore there's no borrowing rate, and therefore there's no return on invested funds. So Blue Water, what was that? Uh, what was that LOS back here? Yeah, discuss leverage, risks of leverage, all that kind of stuff. So there we go. That's probably going to show up as a question of trying to figure out how we're going to evaluate Blue Water. And by the way. You know, the easiest way to think of this is to say, okay, look at that 5.9 return and the 3.2 borrowing rate return is greater than the borrowing rate. So this is probably a fairly efficient use of leverage. If those were switched, then it would be, uh, then it would be the opposite. And remember, when you borrow, when you use this leverage, you know, you, you, you use the leverage to magnify returns. We're going to see magnify positive returns here for blue water, but but if the opposite, you would ma magnify negative returns as well. All right, a couple of other notes here that Lena makes. Blue water is the only fund of the three that uses leverage. Well, we just saw that from the uh, from the previous table, and then Crayford is the only one that holds a significant number of bonds that have embedded options. So that means things like a callable bond. It might mean a puttable bond. It might mean a convertible bond. It might mean other kinds of exotic bond issues that are out there. So let's briefly look at the questions here. We shouldn't be surprised to read question one. Hey, what about inflation protection? Question two, how about that rolling yield? Question three, What's the leveraged return on the portfolio? And that's for Blue Water. And then question four, what about the expected change in price based on whatever those other words are down there? So there's, there's interest rate risk. So we've got a whole mishmash of questions that relate to those, uh, those three LOSs on one of those first slides. All right, so this one, this first one is super easy, and this is explained extremely well inside of this learning module. All we're going to do, let me go back to that, uh, let me go back here to this uh, exhibit one. So looking at Blue Water, just 5% floating rate bonds, just 5% inflation linked bonds. So those things, that blue water, that has very little protection. But notice Crimson and Graveford, 30 and 22, 25 and 20. So really, all we need to do is sum those numbers. 5 and 5 is 10 for blue water. You can do the math there. You probably don't need, hopefully you don't need your calculators for that. So Crimson there in the middle, 55%. Let me just say a couple of things quickly here. You know, it should be obvious that inflation-linked bonds offer protection against inflation, right? That sounds to me like it makes perfect sense. But what about the floating rate bonds? Why, why do these things offer protection? So remember the relationship between inflation and interest rates as inflation increases, then the general level of interest rates will also follow. And remember that the, uh, the price of a floating rate bond is always going to be around its par value on the date of the coupon payment because what the firm or the issuing entity tries to do is match the uh, coupon rate, the floating coupon rate, with the current yield to maturity, whatever's out there, and that forces the bond to, uh, to sell at $1,000. So that's going to also provide protection. I mean, it's essentially protection against interest rate risk, but inflation risk is a big part of that interest rate risk. So uh, that gives you some, uh, some extra ammunition on the exam. Notice we're in this question, we're just asked to show our calculations, but we could have been asked to show our calculations and justify uh, our choice, and then you could have gone through uh, the conversations that I just had. All right, what do we get when we uh, when we buy a bond? I said this earlier, we want the coupon payments and then we want the capital appreciation. So we're going to call that the combination of those two. We're going to call that the rolling yield. It's the coupon return and the roll down return. So the coupon income, this is easy. This is just like dividend yield, but we're going to call it current yield. So there's the annual coupon average payment 415 over that 10850. So we get 382 current yield on the bond. And then the roll down return is just, uh, did we buy low and sell high? In this case, we bought high and sold low. You might remember back in the beginning of level one, I said the easiest way to do this is just to do an F over P minus one, but you can do it that way. So that gets us a minus 2.3%, sum the minus 2.3 uh, to the 3.82, and you get uh, 1.52.
How about the leveraged return on blue water? And so this is going to be a simple equation. So you look at the one, look at the one in the middle with all that stuff in there. Forget about that one. Look at the one on the right hand side of the equal sign. And I'm going to caution you here. I'm going to try to help you memorize this for the exam. I want you to think about this. So leverage return. I want you to think about, hey, it looks a little bit like the capital asset pricing model. Now, it's not the capital asset pricing model. Do not tell your finance professors that I said this. But look, you've got a beginning number plus some set measure of sensitivity. There's a ratio. And then you have a difference between the two. So it has the relative kinds of inputs of the capital asset pricing model, but the, the inputs are a little bit different. So we're going to start in this case with that return on invested funds. And then we're going to add the difference between, and this is what I was saying earlier on that, uh, on that earlier slide regarding the difference between the 5.9 and the 3.2. That's positive. So this is probably a good thing, right? And then we're just going to adjust that. We're going to scale it according to some measure of sensitivity. Now, the capital asset pricing model puts uh, beta in there. The Even the capital market line would put the standard deviation of the portfolio divided by the standard deviation of the market portfolio. Well, here, all we're doing is taking the ratio of the two values. So 47 is the amount of the borrowed funds. 104 is that um, is that equity portfolio. So you get 7.13. So it's not capital asset pricing model. However, if you can remember capital asset pricing model formula, which I'm guessing by level three now you have that, you have that uh, embedded and seared into your brains. Well, this has uh, super similarities to it. And then the last question will focus on um, on interest rate risk. And so the question then becomes, you know, expected change in price. So how do we measure interest rate risk? Well, we know we do that with duration. We know we do that with convexity. But here's the key. These Crayford's holdings, these things have, what did that, what did that one of those notes say? A substantial amount of bonds with embedded options. So we like convexity. We like modified duration, and those are great measures of interest rate risk, but we need effective duration to handle the non-linearity of those bonds that have embedded options. And so here's our constructed response. There we go. Crayford only has number of uh, bonds with embedded options. Effective duration, what that does, it accounts for that price sensitivity, um, depending on things like, you know, hey, they might be exercised, the, the embedded option might be exercised when with just a regular old option free bond, there's not there's not that choice. So let's go ahead and justify our answer. And remember that duration is a first derivative. And so by definition, that means that it's going to be a line. So we've been talking about du duration for a long, long time. But remember, that captures the linear relationship between price and yield. Effective duration you know, using that new kind of a formula where in the numerator you have the price if interest rates go up, the price if interest rates go down. What that effectiveness does, the effective duration, it captures, it's more accurate. It captures the nonlinearity of that embedded option. So we've put down three kind of justifications here. So there's the first one I said, it captures that Im embedded option. It's more accurate. Now remember, it's not completely accurate. Notice we don't say that it's perfectly mathematically accurate. And I would be tempted if I were answering this question. And of course the uh, Institute doesn't emphasize this too terribly much in this reading, but I would be tempted to say, okay, if we use effective duration, we're gonna get a more accurate estimate of that price sensitivity. But if we use effective duration and effective convexity, we're going to have an even more accurate estimate of price sensitivity. And then there's the third one, nonlinearity. I talked about that just a few moments ago. So what I want you to do now is go to those 12 questions at the end of this learning module. We've probably covered seven or eight of the topics, but there's another three or four that I want you to cover. Um, so hey, thanks for watching. Have a great day and good luck studying.